Well, um, when you the you want the I'm not really ready to introduce our, our speaker. Well, firstly, um, welcome. Um, we meet on um, Gadigal land, and I acknowledge um, the Aboriginal elders, um, past, present, and emerging. Um, we, we're uh, very fortunate today to have uh, an eminent speaker, Peter Atkinson. Um, I've sort of been around New South Wales government um, for a while, so I know a little bit about Peter. Um, also, um, Peter's a Barker colleague now, so he and I used to watch um, our kids play sport at Barker College. But Peter um, is currently the, um, um, he tells me he's a, he's a, he's a part time um, commissioner of the New South Wales Productivity Commission, and his commission has recently. Um, released a report and um, you're all going to get copies of that. So that's something to um, anticipate. Um, now, in, in the report, um, Peter makes a very, uh, very important point that um, the demands in government are getting um, greater and greater, but the revenue side is um, somewhat constrained. So you've probably got both the Commonwealth and state governments running structural deficits. So Peter's um, paper goes a bit to the um, the revenue side, one way of in, in increasing revenue is through productivity and the tax system picks that up. And then that somewhat that, that takes some of the pressure off um, increases in, in taxes. And so in, in some ways, who better to, um, to address these issues than somebody who was a former um, uh, deputy um, Commissioner of Taxation for the ATA, uh, Commissioner for um, the State uh, Revenue Office, raising the state revenues, um, but also a former um, Auditor General of New South Wales. Now, that last job, um, I, I, I sort of encourage people not to be put, to, put off by that too much because Peter is not your standard uh, bean counter. In fact, uh, he's not even an accountant at all. He, um, he, his uh, qualifications are in economics, commerce, and interesting law. Uh, he, um, um, one stage was a barrister and appeared in the High Court of Australia. So he's had a varied career. He certainly wouldn't want to be pigeonholed as an accountant because basically he isn't one. But that gives him a, a very broad perspective um, on the matters that he's going to speak to. So, um, Peter, um, it gives me a pleasure to welcome you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Matt. To come to say a few words. Um, I'm particularly pleased to see um, a few friends in the audience Alexander Meldrum, who helped me set up the Historic uh, Treaty Commission, Peter Thorburn, who I worked with at Morley Parsons, uh, Malcolm Kerr, the state member, Richard uh, Sheldrake. Uh, so lovely to see you um, um, can, can you hear me up the back there? Now, I asked that question uh, early on in the, in the talk, and I'll tell you why. Um, George mentioned Barker College. Um, I was invited to um, talk to my daughter's Year 12 church youth group, which operated out of Barker College, about on their careers night. And um, they rang up and they said, uh, Mr. Anxistrat, they, you, you know, you're in the audit office. Would you be able to talk to the year 12 girls at the church youth group about uh, careers? I said, great, I'll do that. And she said, 30 minute talk and no longer. So I said to my daughter, is it OK if I do that? She said, yes, Dad, you can do that if you promise not to embarrass me. And so I said, OK, I'll do that. So I turned up on the night and it was a room like this. The acoustics were a bit like this. And that's, that's why I asked this question. So I turned up and it was the person speaking before me was one of the mothers uh, speaking about uh, how to be a fashion model. Uh, and the person after me was one of the older sisters talking about why you should be a fighter pilot uh, uh, flying an F-111. And I was going to talk in the middle of half an hour about why you should become a cost accountant. <laughs> so um, I was going to be a, a, a little bit of a challenge. 
Uh, I started talking, and it was probably it was a 30 minute talk. It was probably one of the best talks I'd ever given right? because uh, to year 12 girls, and what happened was they just introduced the new uh, auditing standard AA speed 58 in relation to operating leases versus um, finance leases. And I was hoping to get really into the detail about that. I went through chapter and verse through all 400 paragraphs, right? And um, I, I thought it was a really good speech. But um, unfortunately, a couple of the young ladies up the back started sort of looked like they were dropping off. Yeah. I couldn't understand it. They looked like they were dropping off. So um, I said, look, um, the acoustics in this room are terrible, absolutely terrible. Obviously, people can't hear what I'm saying. If there's someone sitting in a seat that can't hear what I'm saying, uh, please put up your hand and we can swap seats with somebody. That, that anyway, one of the young ladies up, up front Put a hand up, and and I said, um, "Oh, um, are you having trouble hearing?" And she said, "No, Professor Baxter. Um, I've been sitting here for 25 minutes, uh, and I've heard every single word you've spoken about cost accounting, and I'd gladly swap seats with someone who can't hear." <laughs> so, if people can't hear, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about collectivity education white paper. And um, we don't have couples for everyone, and I know there's maybe some people online as well, and um, they can look at it online. We've got uh, 10 copies which we'll hand out, and I'll, I'll walk through a couple of the pages for some of the people. But before I do, if productivity is the amount of goods and services made per person in Australia, we want it to increase every year, don't we? If that's what productivity is, the amount of goods and services produced per person. Uh, and we we know that productivity improved steadily from 1960 to 2010 in Australia. It improved. So each year there were more goods and services made per person than the year before. Uh, and it was in the, in the 60s and 80s, it was around three or four percent. But um, and then um, after the year 2000, it dropped off. And didn't increase as much. But if each year there's more goods and services produced than the year before per person, then the quality of life can go up and real wages can go up because everyone's got more. But then after a while, towards the end of two, around 2010, the rate of growth was steady and also was only about 1%. So then the, the ability for real wages and quality of life to go up is not high if there's only a 1% increase. And then the year before COVID, uh, productivity went backwards. So there were less goods and services made in 2019 than there were in 2018 per person. Now, for a number of reasons, um, one of them is demographics. Um, as there were more, as we got older, more people left the workforce and joined the workforce. Uh, and so, um, if there's less people, as the percentage that went from 51% of the population working to 50 and a half percent, less people working, so the population. <coughs> anyway, so the government decided we've got to do something to increase productivity. And what, what I'm going to do is just maybe ask each, each table what are the, the things since the beginning of time in history that have helped improve productivity? So I'm going to ask each. each Two people, this one, the chap up there. I'm going to ask each table. So, name a thing in the history of time which has improved growth. Yes, sir. Uh, software and scale. Software and scale, absolutely. Another thing? Transistor. Transistor, yep. Technology. Te technology, and let's unpack that one a little bit for people. Technology, yes, sir. The internet. The internet? People wanting a shortcut. People wanting a shortcut, okay. Well, that's, that's, the, that's the incentive. Now, all these things. <laughs> Next, steam engine. This one, yeah. yes, yes. Peter. Steam. When you say steam, you don't mean stem. Because when, when, yes, sir. Women entering the workforce. Yes, in 1966, the big influx of women into the workforce when the rules were changed to allow married women to join uh, Commonwealth and public services. Women joining, and ever since then. The uh, ability of childcare, etc. Any other is automation or intelligence? Yeah, AI, you know, intelligence. Yes, sir. 
capital investment. And so the more capital investment, the more can be used per person. Literacy. Literacy, absolutely. Literacy one. Secondly, <coughs> mental health. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, mental health was is actually going the other way, of course. Mental health is and Obesity. Obesity. And obesity is now one of the biggest causes of unemployment because people can't walk, can't have jobs in the You're absolutely right. I'm not going to do And you're also right about mental health. Um, not just from the people who can't come to work, but those who are coming to work. Uh, okay, so, yes, sir. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is like because it costs $500 million. <coughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. And as the Federal Foreign Gifts Commission, which is a much larger organisation than the US. George, and then George. Dr. Dr. Lightning. Dr. Lightning. And improved it in many areas. Yes, yeah. electricity. Electricity? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so there's lots of things that have happened, lots of things have been invented. I mean, Steve mentioned the wheel and that sort of stuff, the combine harvest stuff, and that. Uh, and they've been adopted and adapted. And I'll be releasing a paper next week which will show that in Australia we, we don't seem to. Consumers tend to uh, uh, embrace new technology and iPhones and that very quickly, but businesses don't tend to um, adopt uh, new technologies from overseas as quickly as, um, as some other countries do. And so uh, I haven't focused on the R&D side, focusing on So coming back to productivity, so we want to find ways to improve productivity. Um, the New South Wales government established the Productivity Commission, which I'm fortunate to be in charge of. And we initially went around and to each of the government departments to try to find ways to help them improve productivity. So we would do small, small type. So, for example, we would hear that the Office of State Revenue uh, were concerned that a lot of the payroll taxpayers, um, middle, medium sized ones, uh, had to do everything manually because the MYOB and all these software companies didn't necessarily have um, the software on their um, their payroll platforms because every state had a different payroll tax system. And so there was a lot of manual intervention. So the I said to the Office of State Revenue, why don't we just make it so that payroll taxpayers just pay a twelfth of the year before and then they do an annual reconciliation at the end of the year instead of doing a reconciliation every every month. And Treasury New South Wales Treasury said, well, we can't do that because we have a loop of companies that are doing more. Um, we want them to reconcile every month because they're, they're increasing the turnover. So we're going to lose out on tax revenues. And so I was able to show that if we allowed them to just pay across them for automatic direct debit with no interventions, and they just did one um, reconciliation at the end of the year, yes, we'd lose a bit of time, cost of money. That would be more than offset by the productivity gains. So we're able to get that done. That was so I don't want to labor on that, but we did a whole lot of those smaller initiatives. And then Dominic and the, the treasurer said to me, Peter, would you be able to come up with a white paper with a whole suite of ideas to improve productivity? I said, sure. He said, okay, I want you to come up with a white paper by such and such date. And I said, to them, Treasurer, I'm um, a stickler for um, the Westminster system. And um, I don't want to give you some solutions without telling the public what the problem is. Uh, he said, "No, no, just just give me, give us the solution, give us the solution. Oh, I've got to explain to the public what the problem is because if they don't know the problem, they're not going to accept it." Um, now, any any taxi driver with an iPad could come up with a productivity idea. Right? It's 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 a matter of selling it to the community to be able to do that. That's the hardest part. So I said. I'm going to do three stage Western system discussion paper, green paper, white paper. He said, Well, that, that's that's a waste of time. And I said, Treasurer, 
Do you recall when the former government, federal government, tried to introduce a five dollar co payment for GPs? Does anyone remember that? So, people remember that a lot of work done by bureaucrats uh, saying we're going to implement this five dollar co payment, and clearly, we know at the time 90 percent of GP um, visits were off bill, and the efficient GPs were doing 12 visits an hour, right? Off bill, they were the efficient ones, and people say, well, they weren't really effective 12 an hour, right? So, we, so there was a there was an issue and a problem, and the, the whole place was going to bleed of money unless something was done. So, someone came up with the idea of five dollar co payment, but didn't tell the public what the problem was. So, the the idea was published. Uh, at 8.30 one morning, the radio talkbacks got hold of it, uh, and by 9.30 that day, it was scotched. Uh, do you remember that? Does anyone remember that? Yeah. Uh, and that is a classic example of policy, uh, a solution looking for a problem. So what, what we did was we said, we're going to find out and tell people what the problem is. And so the first thing we did was issued a discussion paper. We said, Here, here's the problem. One problem is that the NAPLAN results, we've talked about education, my friend, and literacy. So the literacy results in New South Wales uh, since 2000 have steadily gone down every year, and we've gone from the top mainland state to the worst performing mainland state, right, on literacy. At the same time, expenditure per student in real terms has gone up, uh, and now uh, in total, uh, it's about $17,000 a student. Um, that, that's including um, private the government payments to private schools and public schools. It's about 17000 If you just looked at the payments to government schools only, it's, of course, higher. It's about 20000 right per student. So the price of the, the cost per student is going up, the results are going down. So that's a problem. We give other problems in this discussion paper and say to the community, here are the problems. Can you tell us what some of the solutions are? Because if we can get buy-in from people, we can get a better chance. Uh, other other problems we put in there, we would say, why is it that in New South Wales, the average person uses up 250 litres or big liters one or two of water a year, uh, whereas in uh, Victoria, uh, it's only 150. Why is that? Right? Uh, and all these questions, we put all these questions in the discussion paper. And Alexandra helped me do a whole lot of um, workshops with a lot of people and uh, lots and lots of workshops uh, with various industries and various topics and people then sent us in their suggestions on how to address problems uh, and when we got all those ideas we put them together in a green paper now you think I'm green and white but, but, but just trust me because it, it's a pretty effective way because um, our, our recommendations have been accepted you might have seen on Sunday's paper Pharmacies now doing um, uh, giving more scripts out, um, um, and that was, we identified that saying there's a problem. Not enough GPs. How can we do it? We can train a lot more GPs, or we can get the pharmacists to do some of the more administrative work and issue prescriptions. Uh, and we've been working on that. And then on, on Friday, the government accepted that recommendation. Okay, so we had the discussion paper. Here's the problem. Give us ideas. We had the green paper, which had 53 ideas that other people had given them. And then we put that green paper on the web and, and, and really consulted widely with them. Now, a typical government document on the web is looked at by about 600 to 700 people, but not many, obviously. Have a guess how many people looked at my green paper. Give us a number. How many do you think looked at the green paper? 38,000. 38,000, it's more than 38,000. I've got to want a number to you. 38,000. How many? Come on, give me a number. Give me a number. How many? 60,000, more than 50,000. Up the back there, Malcolm, a number. 50,000. How many people looked at the green paper? Give me a number. Going, a number. 80,000, more than 80,000. I've got to be here all day because um, it was 3.1 million, right? Which was absolutely, absolutely. Now, I'm not saying everybody read every page of it. I'm saying that at least three point one billion saw this come, right? So they were attracted to it, and that by uh, by government standards, that is. So we then got the um, all those ideas in there, 
other people's ideas. So I was able to go and spook around to Parliament, to crossbench, to the opposition and the government. This is what other people are saying. And then they kept saying, what do you want to say, Mr. Extra? What are you going to say? So we listened to your submissions. We got in lots and lots of submissions. And that's why we created the, um, the, the white paper and safety recommendations. And uh, Ben, if I can get you to just distribute the um, paper, the little slide pack, um, not, the, not the documents. And I just want to um, we can maybe one between two so that people get a bit of an idea of what we did and then I can um, it'll make it a little, lot easier for questions. So maybe actually just a few on each, on each table. So maybe if you can look on one, on one to three or one to two, whatever. Um, what, what we're going to do is just go through the philosophy and then I'll open it up. And I know that people want to talk about um, other topics like education and electricity and things like that. So please uh, look, look at it with the person next to you. Okay, so if you can at least um, if you can at least look, look on with some with somebody. I think behind you there, Ben, as well. Okay, so okay, so basically, just I'll just run through what all the what all these slides are saying. And my apologies to the people online. If you go to our website, you can find the website. New South Wales Productivity. Okay, so the second page shows you the process where you've got the discussion paper, the green paper, the paper. The third slide shows you the seven areas that we focused on, uh, and that um, in relation to schools, VET, which is uh, skills regulation, um, water and energy, infrastructure, planning, and taxation. So we had recommendations in each of those. Um, and I must say, I was very pleased to hear um, you be talking about things like skills as a productivity and labor. Often people just talk about things that have been invented but skills is, is very important. If you then look at the problem on the skills one, if you look at the skills slide, it shows the problems on the left-hand side. And that problem shows you, I'm on slide four, those who are on that shows you the trades where there's been a gap, uh, a skills gap over the last 30 years. Uh, and so you can see the top one, I'll use that as an example, which is air conditioning mechanics. So 27 seven of the last 30 years, there's been a shortage of air conditioning mechanics. And you might say, well, who cares? That doesn't matter. It's vital, vital, because if you live in Dubbo and you're a, you're a butcher in Dubbo and your freeze breaks down and you have to wait three days for the air conditioning mechanic to fix it, you're going to be trouble. So all these trades and skills, there's a shortage. And so we, we, we give the facts and we say the problem, there's a chronic shortage of vet skills, especially in trades. Then we come up with a couple of solutions. Um, uh, in, in relation to them. We'll come to those in more detail. The next slide talks about housing and planning, and that shows shortage of housing uh, in New South Wales over the last few years and projected. And people have said, oh, during COVID, there hasn't been as big a shortage of housing. Well, there has been, but if we don't do something, you can see how bad it's going to get. And we've got a lot of recommendations in there on how to address um, the housing um, uh, issues to get more planning. You see, social yeah, social, absolutely affordable housing and social housing as well. And, um, and, and as you as, as we know, the social housing used to be basically for um, low paid key workers, workers, and now it's all, almost all used up by people who aren't, aren't working. So we've got to now work out how to get key workers. And the next slide just shows the benefits if we implement our Over the page there, we're looking now at. Um, Teaching one on slide seven, which has got the, um, the the problem facing our schools. You can see there that um, we've got the NAPLAN results going in one direction, and as I've said, the expenditure per child going in the other direction. Uh, and um, we believe if we can implement the recommendations I'm suggesting, uh, there can be a um, eleven billion dollar gain over the next twenty years. Um, and that, so that's on the next page if you just see the gain. Um, and our total gains, if all of them, all 60 recommendations were implemented, we believe there's a $33,000 per person 
increase in real wages um, in today's world. So what are we saying? I'll use the schools one as an example. If you turn over the page, um, people tell you that there are that there are 14, at least 14 ways to improve outcomes in schools, and they might be wrong. You've got out of school stuff and you've got within the school. Now, each of them need to be addressed in some way, but the Productivity Commission, uh, we're only a very small agency, uh, we had to focus on one, right? So we focused on teacher quality. We thought um, other people are looking at other issues. So if you turn the page and see um, teacher quality is our, um, the we will, our research in Lloyds and others have shown biggest um, gain to improving the NAPLAN results is through teacher quality and address the others. So the next page shows you some of the recommendations we put forward and they're in three groups. So there's one group in relation to how do we broaden the supply of teachers? The second one is how do we get teachers, our really hard working great teachers, how do we get them to be more effective? And the third one is how do we retain our best? And so if you look at it, uh, for example, with the broadening supply, I'm very pleased to say that my recommendation at, at, years ago, you did your degree of three years in maths or science, or then you did a one-year diploma of education. You remember those days to become a teacher? And then it changed. Instead of a one-year diploma to become a teacher, you had to do a two-year master's. Right? And what we found in the community, there were a large number, not large, there was a number of senior finance professionals and CSIRO type scientists who in their 40s didn't mind becoming a teacher. But there's no way they're going to give up two years of um, no pay to study a master's and become a teacher. Now you might think there's none of these that exist, but they do these people exist. So our recommendation was that these people shouldn't have to do it to years. If we've got a hedge fund manager who spent 25 years in a hedge fund now wants to be a maths teacher because there is a real shortage of STEAM, STEAM teachers, um, S-T-E-A-M, so science, technology, engineering, auditing, and um, <laughs> I'm glad you're listening. I'm so glad you're listening. Say, I've got to say your confidence with this. <laughs> so um, the Peter Thornton says STEAM. Anyway, so the recommendation is that these people in the finance sector we should assume they know a bit about maths. Good fair point. And so instead of asking them to do a two-year degree, masters of teachers, we should bespoke, we should sit down next to them and find out what training do you need and just give them almost a lack of education. Right? Uh, and I'm very pleased to say that the government um, uh, has accepted that and the first 28 um, maths teachers uh, started in the beginning of third term this year. And I'm really, really pleased. Having said that, those you'll know that there is a counter-argument People saying you cannot be a proper teacher unless you do the full two years. Uh, that, and maybe people who deliver the university courses and other people are saying it. Um, there's no evidence to show that. But what we're able to do now is to track these 28 and just to see how it goes. And if it turns out that there are bits of flop uh, and that they can't teach, well, fair enough, I'll have egg on this. But we've got an experiment to do this. And, um, and with the experimentation, I'll make this final point. Questions. With the experimentation, we made a lot of recommendations outside the white paper on how to get through COVID. Um, right? So we said, look, if you, um, you work with Coles and Woolies and say, look, maybe we should allow deliveries uh, of toilet paper at three o'clock at night in the morning, right? If I'd said that before COVID, I would have been laughed out of the front of the house because all the noise these folks made. Um, but it was accepted and the community accepted that. Uh, we recommended electronic signatures and stat decks, accepted. We recommended Zooms for strata types, accepted. We recommended Alfresco dominant, accepted. So some people say, oh, Peter, you're taking advantage of COVID, right? They have to get all these things. Maybe, maybe. Um, um, and lots of these recommendations would never have got anywhere uh, if there was no. We, the community didn't know what the problem was, and in COVID, they said, you yeah. Anyway, so wind back the end of COVID, people come up and say, oh, these um, these 43 um, COVID recommendations of the back to strut, they're all going to go back to how they were before, unless Peter can prove that each one of them is effective. So they're all going to go back, and I recommended to the government, they all should start 
unless someone should that they they're not picked. Is everyone with me? The sort of group yeah. of groups. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so lots of arguments, and Malcolm will know a bit from Harvard. So I met with Ross Spencer's all sorts of people and trying to persuade people that look they should all automatically continue unless um, someone can prove that it's a mistake. Now let, I'll just do a show of hands to see who, who who's on my side and who's on my who, who's on my side. I think that they should all just continue unless someone can prove them wrong. Okay, yeah, who's, on, who's on the ladies' side? Not that I'm reading the witness. Well, who's on the witness? So, anyway, so again, it was all about implementation and getting people on the side. And so I'm very pleased to say the government accepted my They were all accepted in one situation, and I'm glad, I'm glad they didn't accept that one. You'll recall, and I'll tell you what the, the bad one is because I've got to be honest, so one that I missed out on. In COVID, we recommended that. Because of um, building, that um, you had less less workers on site because they had to be more remote. So instead of having 20 workers on site at one time, they could only have 10. Do you remember that? And so the building really slowed down. Um, so we recommended that building be allowed on Saturdays, right? And, um, and in certain circumstances, Sundays, but not not weekends. But building be allowed on Saturdays. And during COVID, it helped, right, by building on Saturdays. People were annoyed that there was a noise next door and things like that, but they put up with it because they knew. End of COVID, when I recommended that that should continue, then um, uh, there was a, a ground of people saying, no, it's making too much noise. So I met with um, your, your successors, um, Richard and Planning Department, um, and we, we agreed to go to government with a recommendation that if it's, if it's if there is no residential properties within a certain kilometre distance, then they should be able to build on set. Really? So I didn't win it. I, mean, I think it was a good solution. In fact, I'm glad I was. So, anyway, so that's a, a bit of a thumbnail sketch of that activity. I'll just ask um, Ben now can you just get some of the white papers? We'll run through these very quickly and then. Um, well, any questions at this stage on, on the paper I'll just hand out, please? Yes, sir. Please. Um, one of the things that struck me about uh, teachers is that they spend an inordinate amount of time doing non-teaching activities. Have you have you considered the uh, the possibility of of uh, recommending that somehow or other other people can be provided to do the things that the teachers are not trained to do? Absolutely. In other words, uh, you know, like classroom super. I mean. Playground supervision, this sort of stuff. Absolutely, and we're working on that at the moment. It wasn't in our original, uh, but I'm working closely with Georgia Education, precisely that. And there's a crowd called Bratton, I don't know if you've ever heard of Bratton, um, but they've done a really good um, bit of research. I must say, a lot of this research, we're only a very small organisation, so there's only, there's only six of us, right? So there's only six of us. Um, and so we don't actually, have the, the time and resources to, to go into each one of the things. I can second people from other places. Um, they, they, I don't think this gentleman's had a chance to get out of them. Peter, it seems to me all your grievances could be addressed by dealing with your questions around supply, best practice, and retention by introducing, reintroducing space. Oh, okay, very good point. Thank you. Okay, so one of the issues with the tapes, of course, is that. Well, and this is this is what I've heard, but I don't have documents. That um, the careers advisor in a school for Year Ten students is usually a university educated careers advisor. And when the person at Year Ten comes to the careers advisor and says, "What should I do?" Rightly or wrongly, there's a suggestion they go to the even if, and and again, this is just anecdotal, but I, and so that's why I haven't actually put it back. People are telling me. Um, a lot of people are going to university probably better off at TAFE. That's one thing. The other thing I'm hearing is that when I talk to the boss of TAFE, there's pro private providers who can do the, the easy stuff with no capital equipment, like the um, barista courses and things like that, accounting. Uh, when it comes to the big heavy engineering stuff, TAFE, it's wonderful how Caterpillar and all those places are coming in partnership uh, with TAFE, where people can go and see these huge machines. 
but there is a real capital expenditure. One of the issues we're trying to look to and are looking at is in the year 11 and 12, having a combined TAFE school situation where you can have a credit for some of the stuff that you're assessing. But the TAFE and the VET uh, is, is certainly an area we at least to look at. Sir, off the back, where's Peter? Oh, Peter's got the line. Sorry. Peter, I'm just reflecting on what the 28 uh, people who other than teaching qualifications and teaching and reflecting. They were the spoke beforehand. They were sat down and they said, what, what skills do they? And they did have a bit of training on how to be a teacher, how to get on with parents, but it wasn't too Right, right. Very short. so, I mean, well, we all know that every industry sets up barriers to entry. So, you know, a two-year mark is a classic sort of barrier to, to entry. But I'm reflecting on the teachers I had at Sydney University. I had a math teacher and a math who really could teach. Uh, and I had um, a, a teacher, a men's teacher in applied mathematics who really couldn't uh, teach probably both, both, both great mathematicians. But wouldn't there be some sort of road which says, you know, a three month intensive training course run over the long break to, to give you the kind of skills that you need to, to have to get in front of the classroom? Absolutely, absolutely, Peter. And I guess that's um, one of the things we're going to be looking at in our future. Of these 28 things. They were each bespoke, so each of them got a little bit different training um, to meet, meet their needs. But if there were, maybe it would make it more attractive if we said there's a three month and you actually get a qualification afterwards. Yes, sir. And then, and then I'll get into the book. Great. Uh, Grant Stephen from Strand 7. Having been an engineer since I was probably three years old on Whiteside here in Glasgow, I've become used over many, many years to the known unknown. The unknown knows, but what it seems to me is your capacity to strike is there in this current uncertain circumstance a lot of unknowns, but it's to do with you know things going wrong, like storms, whatever. These are known, but we seem to be un not ready for them. We seem to be captured by surprise. So we that optimistic uh, that the world will suddenly solve all these problems. How do you factor in the known unknown European? I knew that. I knew that. I don't have to do that. One of the one of the things we've done is, is um, we've listened to the, these hundreds of thousands of people give us ideas because these things that I'm saying to you are not are not my ideas. They're what other people have said, and then I've come forward. But you're right. There's a lot of unknowns, and I've told you before. Uh, as George said, I'm I'm part time in this job. I also have a lot of other other jobs, one of which is I'm the chairman of Kingstown Airport. Now, um, we're the fourth busiest airport in Australia, um, but most of our revenue uh, comes from uh, manufacturing, you know, from, from uh, old warehouses and manufacturing and things like that. We're, uh, and we want to make sure we keep this high quality manufacturing at Kingstown Airport. Now, I can't turn around and say, I can guarantee electricity for years, I can guarantee good labour, I can guarantee this. We've got to make it so that they want to stay in Sydney and, and grow. Um, I guess it's just if we can get a good pool of skills for people coming through and they don't need to be trained in cyber and um, um, what's all the new stuff, the, um, the, 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 the turbo cache and all that sort of stuff. They don't need to be trained. Just have to have the skills to be able to adapt because the, the, the skills people have got when they start on the job today, they're going to be laughed at in five years' time. Yes, sir. Um, so, there are humans, right? I'm curious uh, as to whether, certainly in the current context, or perhaps more broadly, if uh, uh, you've done any work on the impact of more flexible minimum wage policy and what impact that might have to the employment, but on overall productivity. No, I've done no, absolutely no work. As I said, there's only six or seven of us. Uh, then we've got to be selected in areas like that. So it would be nice to, nice to know the answer. Um, we haven't done anything in our white paper. We haven't done anything on that by our all mental health. This is a big issue. But um, given the limited resources we have, we didn't want to try to cover that. If I could just get you to look on just with one of your friends there at this, at this yeah. book. If you can turn to page 45, I just want to get. You get a bit of a flavour. And those, those of you who are online, um, you can find the, the white paper in what the Pro Ghibli website. 
So if you go to page 45 to start with, I just want to run through a couple of things with you. This shows um, our general recommendations uh, in relation to, to, to teaching, for example. So we have um, um, three, three pages of recommendations on the teaching. Um, if you go then to page 65, I just want to show you some other things. We talk about some specific case studies uh, about it. it works well in some places. Why, why can't we make it work elsewhere? When I said the NAPMAN figures are going down, on average they're going down. Some schools are going up. Some schools are doing much better. And you know what I think we should do? Try to find out what's happening in our schools, right? And then, but having said that, the argument is um, not invented here and all that sort of stuff. But I still think the schools that are doing really well where their NAPMAN results are increasing, we've got to learn from those. You know, there's some case studies in there. If I can get you to go to 74. Uh, which uh, is, we've also looked at what happens in other countries. So um, everyone generally talks about the, the beautiful Finland, but we've got um, other ones that are more similar to Australia than Finland. I mean, the, the education results in Finland were pretty good, uh, but a very different system. And we've got, um, turn now to page 85, that lists um, many of our recommendations in relation to. The, the, the vet system, the, the, the skills system, uh, we go through those. Page, um, the next one is page 98, is a case study there on, on um, air conditioning mechanics, uh, how difficult it is to become one. That's on page 98. Uh, nearly finished, so 103, uh, tell women in the engineering business. Um, we're, we're a firm believer that if we can improve the number of women, um, in the engineering space, uh, we're going to go a long way there. Uh, 107 uh, just shows you with the vet courses, nearly everyone does a vet course on how to be a barista. But if you if you go to the barista shop and say, I want a job, you know, does he ask if you've got a certain or it's barista -ish? He doesn't. He just says, Are you a decent bloke? Well, ladies, you can work for him. All right, we'll treat you on the spot. So um, I'm being a little bit facetious here. But um, a lot of people do these vet courses. Um, automotive design. I don't know why we need 100 people coming out of vet with automotive design. Is there 100 jobs every year on how to design? So, what we're doing is got to be a little bit more focused on the, the, the course. Just finishing up now. Um, so, that was uh, 115 um, talks about micro credentials, uh, which we which we're, we're very keen on. Um, then on 119, lots of our recommendations being set prepared, um, including uh, e-scooters, etc. And uh, I know somebody asked me about um, about um, nuclear, and um, it's in here the recommendation 512. I'm just trying to find it for the chapter of nuclear. So um, if you look at page 220, 220. Uh, 227, 228. So what we're saying with small nuclear SMR, uh, SMRs, um, and again, this one hasn't been accepted by government, hasn't been rejected, but we're saying energy should be technology neutral. So um, it may well be that if someone wants to build a small modular reactor, a small modular reactor is something which a nuclear thing that can generate enough electricity for that, something like that. And Rolls-Royce and um, Microsoft that's called. Once they're developed and available and proved safe, we'll be behind the overall strategies. We, we said we're not going to consider nuclear. And what, what my concern here is that, okay, maybe nuclear is not safe. I don't know if it is or it isn't. But when they start developing this new stuff, um, we've got to be able to consider each on a case by case basis. It may well be Rolls Royce pigs out there, SMR. We look at it and say it's just too dangerous for them. But I want us to at least ask the question rather than to say flat out, we're not going to have any. You know, I've done a lot of talk on the line. Yes, if you can maybe say your first name. We've got a microphone coming up here, so. Uh, yes, yeah. so. You know, down there in the UK, there was, um, when there was an attempt to change the 
tries to persuade people to do things differently at no cost. For example, uh, in tax, in the, in the past, you would probably sign the tax document at the end saying, is everything accurate? Or I want to show if you sign it at the start, saying everything I'm going to say is accurate. Uh, and also um, in relation to, as we know, recycling, sign on your bin saying 83% of people in the industry uh, to do this. People, so there is a, a, a unit that's in science. One of the things uh, in relation to my recommendations is that there are no cost, basically no cost to government. Right? So um, I could easily, if I was elected member, I could say, let's spend it on this, let's spend it on that. My view is that most productivity enhancements are done by the private sector. And the government's just got to get out of the way. Uh, and um, I know there's a different school of thought that says government should bankroll in concessions. My view is you go through all these, you know, even the teachers coming in, that's going to save them. So, if we're setting up more groups and organisations, I'm just be a bit wary about saying the government's got all the solutions. I think the government's got problems, and we've got to get rid of those problems so that the private sector can get up. If you look at all the input, all the enhancements to productivity, AI, did the government do AI? No. Did technology, did they invent that? No. Uh, the private sector did most of Gauge, and I think that'll be the way in the future. Contrast that with Robert Gordon. I don't know if any, anyone knows Robert Gordon, the American economist, and um, anyone online might want to look him up. Robert Gordon Innovation, look him up. And you'll find that there's a school of thought that says there will be no more productivity gains by r and That's what he says. Uh, Robert Gordon and all his mates, and I disagree with him, says if you go into a house today, it's exactly the same as the house in 1970. You go to the laundry, there's a washing machine, you go to the kitchen, there's freezers, microwave. You know, you know, it's basically the same. And he will go through the whole lot and prove to you that there's been no R&D or innovation since 1970 that has improved productivity. I totally disagree with him at, at every time. But where I do with it is that it's not the government. We shouldn't fund the government. Do the art and say, Oh, government, you go off and do it. Yes, sir. And then Richard. Oh, no, Richard got the microphone. Yeah, thanks very much, Richard. So, that <clears throat> firstly, thanks for a great presentation. You're not going to get any Barker School Girl comments. <laughs> I, think it, I think you've got the women's book. Look, my question relates to, and you've got down here water and energy. Um, what, one of the key issues, and it's currently an unfit for a and it's the Sydney Water Supply Commission. Um, and this academy has taken a sort of strong position. We have fund a um, workshop a number of years ago. And it's about recycling. So, effluent treatment, recycling, and 
putting the um, tertiary purified water back into the ticket office. It is, a, and it's an issue because getting politicians and the community over the line first is, is an issue. But, I mean, are you likely to step into that space? Yeah, absolutely. And one of our recommendations is precisely on the education of the community on potable water. So and there's two parts to it. You recall one of the state elections was lost on the basis of the D South Land versus Free Side. There was a big, big issue. Oh, I, 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 won't, I can't find the recommendation in here, but if there is one, and it's not saying um, we've got to do this, but saying we need an education against the public that we really do need to do recycling. The people at the end of the Murray, Murrumbidgee, they live there, and the water they drink's been through what, six sets of intestines, right? And, and they're still drinking. Right? Um, what we've got to do is explain it to them. That's one side. The other side is new houses that have to be built with um, uh, rainwater coming off. Uh, it might be that when they're built, 100% of them have a rainwater tank. Three years later, only half of them are working. Have they fixed them? The others do Why don't they fix them? Because it's cheaper to get the water into the mains, mm -hmm. right, rather than to get the thing fixed. They built the thing to meet the requirement of um, for the BASIC, whatever it was, but then they didn't want fixing it. Now, I, I, I suggest that maybe we should encourage people to keep those things going. The other thing on Sydney water, on water, and I'm pleased to say it, I'm, I'm a believer that um, our water is, is too cheaply priced, right? Uh, that um, if you go anywhere else in the world, people aren't washing their car with water. Right, that and the, the, what they're washing the car is equivalent to water that sit bottle and drink on really good quality water. So um, I I really want IPART to look at a situation where um, and they've accepted half the recommendation. The recommendation was that we have a pricing structure that discourages overuse of <coughs> what they have implemented is when the dam level gets below a certain then the water prices will fall. So that's a start. Which I still think water is, is a valuable thing. One of the things um, with our whole white paper, and all six of us at the Commission have followed this, the previous government had quite rightly an idea of asset recycling. We've got these assets, electricity wise, whatever, not being used effectively. Let's recycle these assets uh, and use that money to build a hospital or road. Everyone with us on that one? Our, the flavour coming through our one here is asset optimization. Existing assets, including water, let's use the existing assets better. Now, these assets are physical assets. We've got, we've got shops that have to shut at five o'clock. Why can't they open the middle? We've got free wood. Well, the T8 is going to have to be replaced, the train line. Why replace that? Why don't we just get more people off the peak out and get them to, to, to drive to get on the train off peak? Why don't we do that? So physical assets should be used better. Human assets should be get used better. Why is it that a, uh, a nurse in Broken Hill is allowed to do certain things which only a doctor in Sydney CBD is allowed to do? Right, because there's a shortage of doctors. And nurses can do it. If a nurse is allowed to do it in Broken Hill, he or she should be able to do it in Sydney. All our human assets should be used better. And in fact, our friend up the train is But the third group of assets we've got to use is dust. A or intellectual. Um, one of the main principles of microeconomic reform is information asymmetry. <coughs> if we can get more people. Thanks, Peter. I, I want to pick up on what you were just saying about asset use. Um, a lot of us here are engineers, and we look at, you know, the, if, if the bridge is below the low of the river or something like that. I have this issue about fiefdom. We have somebody who might be a wonderfully qualified teacher at tertiary level or even at secondary level. He is then confined, he or she is then confined to an institution because they're the ones that employ that person. With COVID, we have learned uh, a lot about um, communication by uh, electronic means and, and videos and so forth. What I really feel we should be looking at is how universities and schools could cooperate 
in much the same way as Central Queensland University does over many, many cities. So that one lecturer or one teacher can have a wider audience and can provide uh, a, us with a, a more efficient and more productive way of education. That's a great idea, particularly, I like it when someone says it's been done elsewhere because it makes it a lot easier for me to persuade so everybody. We so if you've got, we might have that. I'm not sure how our time's going, George. You let me know when I've got five minutes to go. Yeah, I've got five minutes Oh, sorry. I'll let, I'll let you just tell me. 350 pages of, of uh, really rational government, good thinking in the report here. Well done. You, you mentioned the $5 copay, how the radio jockeys undercut that very quickly. Um, I wonder what you think of the notion that disinformation in 2022 is alive and circulating around, and it might threaten the ability of government to put forward rational good government. And how does how does how does the government of New South Wales preempt? You mentioned the Westminster process of going out in three stages and being very patient about about things. Tell me what the government does to to um, foster rational um, logic instead of uh, irrational politics and approaching you know, good information rather than just. I'll answer the first part of the question and then the second part. Of First part of your question is: Do I accept the notion that there's disinformation going out there? Absolutely, absolutely. There's some um, uh, with, the, with the social media and the, uh, whatever. Anyone with a vested interest can put things up. I've I've been quoted myself, quoted as saying things which I've never said. Uh, right. So I totally agree with you, sir. Uh, as to what government should do, uh, I'm not a member of the government, so I'm not in a position to comment on what the government should. All I can say is that this productivity commission. I, I keep believing if we can have other people telling us what the problem is, other people saying we've got some solutions, it's much easier than uh, to have some champions behind you uh, and to do it rather than to um, come up with the solution. So it's a matter of uh, getting the community on board. And I know when I talk to secretaries of departments, if there's a vague interest in something, they'll run with it. But if, if it's totally anathema to them, they, they, they won't go with it. So I've obviously only go for the low hanging fruit, and I'll admit that. Um, uh, maybe the uh, next stage of Productivity Commission, you can take on a bit of the task. So your first point is absolutely there's disinformation. Second one, how would the government do it? I don't know, but how I would do it is just completely with continually reinforce to people. If you want real wages to grow, you've got to improve productivity. Unfortunately, at the moment, my friend, if a, if a policy is put up in 1985 when all the key reforms got up, if there were eight winners and two losers in the short term, but you could prove there are 10 winners in the long term, usually those eight winners in the short term are able to convince the two losers in the short term to go for it. My own, my flavour at the moment is if there are 99 winners in the short term, they are one loser. That loser can talk pretty loud. No, that's, I mean, I'm exaggerating, of course, but, um, and that's why we need to make sure we somehow can get that short term loser into um, three and long term because all the stuff where everyone's in charge has already been done. Did I hear this? Sorry, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Look, I think we have to realise the last three or four decades, the state of New South Wales has been dining out on coal and international students. That's a source of much of our wealth. And I haven't read the report in detail, so what I'm about to say may be inappropriate, and I apologise for that. But it seems to me to be quite innovation light. Uh, the world's changing very fast indeed. I'm a bit worried we're checking the efficiency of the boilers on the Titanic and not quite being aware that we're seeing something really fast. I'm talking industry 4.0. I'm suggesting that uh, there won't be shooting out, so there's not, not much uh, occasion to get on and do things. 
but we should be looking at the best efforts overseas and the best things we can do in Australia and get on about implementing those. I look at the list of big programs, and I think they're not looking at the ones that we really need for the future. We need these sorts of dramatic change. Why are we doing this? Thank you. Okay, um, I'll address four of your five points if it's okay. Um, the fourth one is um, when there's no one shooting us at us, we tend not to uh, uh, look for new ideas. I agree with you. Where, where there's a war or where there's a pandemic, we tend to get things done quickly. I accept that. But let's try to, tra as you say, let's try to change the mindset so we do change it even if no one's shooting us. Secondly, should we look overseas and things like that? Absolutely. Really. Uh, we've got to um, swipe ideas from other places and tailor them in Australia. So that's your fourth and fifth. Your first point in relation to um, dying out on coal with national students. The revenue, uh, the two big, two of our largest three exports of those two areas, I accept that. Um, when, when we say why aren't we looking at other initiatives, I guess the flavour of our report is to try to find smaller ways how the government can get out of the way of the private sector for them to come up with uh, the initiatives. Now, I know that's not the answer to you, but um, our, our first step on here is to, I guess, free up the private sector so that they can get on with the job. And I, I know it's not quite what you're doing. Yes, When England had a serious, serious decline in its education standards, they went and did a big search and they came across a technology from New South Wales University that was invented by a man called John Sleather. It's commonly So, what was his name? Okay, that was John Sleather. And he's one of the great educationists. His plan in life was to become so famous that somebody, one person at New South Wales University, could hurt him. Um, the, the British government hired a ton of graduates of cognitive life theory, took them and changed the way people presented courses. And in doing that, they experimentally optimized courses and things like that. And they gave them to people, teachers didn't have to do that, they were very slow. And now even this right up the top again. Now, we know that. Does that happen here from these people? And we don't implement those sort of things. In the New South Wales government, um, they had this organisation called CESE, and they said, I'll do cognitive load theory, but they didn't then implement it. Now, we, you know, we put in a big proposal to Dobsky and his commission and got adopted 100%. And that was the AES. AEA Road came out of that, which was education, because if you can have an education uh, benefit, you've got to roll it out. And you can't roll it out at school. It's impossible for companies to do it. And we know that literacy is, I mean, the Gillard government tried very hard to upkill the work. And it was a miserable way. They paid people and they did because people didn't have the literacy to do it. And we, we know this literacy is so important and it's the cause of so much suicide, incarceration, and all sorts of things like that. The question I've got for you is I mean, and we know that there are things you can do in this government, trial things actively, proactively pursued. Why isn't the government proactively trying to find a solution to literacy? And it's not. Okay, well, if I can, I think it's very good point that you're making. We all hear about books on the universities with literacy deficiencies, people start to work with literacy deficiencies. I guess if I could just make, make you know, two points in relation to what you're saying. In relation to um, why isn't the government doing it? I'll give an example of an idea of so the two parts of my answer are going to be I need more skills myself in influencing and convincing. A good idea is not going to get anywhere unless you can convince them. I've heard a thousand times people say, I've got this good idea, but my boss just doesn't understand. 
And then I come back to that person and say, why doesn't your boss understand? Well, because he's dead. And I'll basically say, well, why don't you and I sit down together to find a way how we can convince the person that it is useless as he is. So first my skill is to be able to influence. Tell you where I've failed. I'm a firm believer in feedback for all employees. I believe that teachers need in class observers to be there. That's what I'm firm with. I meet with groups of people that say to me, that say to me, how dare you suggest that teachers need feedback? They're professionals, they don't need feedback. And I say to them, look, an engineer is a good employee, gets feedback, but can't suit it. But yet, my friend, I still can't convince them. And you'll say, why haven't I been able to convince people to have an observer? Maybe I don't understand where they're coming from. Maybe they've got some very good reasons why they don't have the in-house um, observer once a year coming in to see them. So in relation to the cognitive stuff and that has been implemented elsewhere, i found that it's easier for me to get the government acceptance, which has been implemented elsewhere, like the suggestion was over here, so that's that. if that's worked in the UK, um, uh, and there's someone with persuasive skills who can put that together, then surely they'll be able to persuade someone. Yeah, it hasn't happened. In New South Wales government, I don't know why, we've had very persuasive people with presentations that have persuaded everybody else. So uh, maybe there's other, uh, and I don't know the specifics to that case, but I know similar ones where it seems like a good idea, but it's not accepted because someone's got another idea. Which is which is uh, counter to it. So, no, no, yeah. Sorry, who, who's next? George has got the mic. Thank yeah, you. I've got um, got the microphone for two reasons. Firstly, I think there's been a great discussion and there's been a great presentation that I think we need to draw to a close. But in doing so, now that I've got the mic, I do have the privilege of asking the last question. And um, so again, to continue the theme of, of education. One of the most worrying um, graphs in that um, handout that you gave was the um, graph that indicated the expenditure per student sort of going up and, 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 and all the math land results going down. I mean, that, that, that's, that's a bit of a shocker. Uh, and that is a huge opportunity for productivity improvement. Um, now, in other countries, I mean, some countries, uh, make better use of their fixed infrastructure, the buildings and schools were having by running two ships. Now, they, get, they actually get their teachers to teach two ships a day now, for different classes. Now, uh, good luck with that here, but we don't need to. In any case, if you have bad, bad teachers teaching two ships, it simply compounds the problem. Um, our problem is more that um, the bottom 20% of teachers are just, you know, time service, to put it bluntly. And, and somehow, and, well, on the other hand, the top of yeah, the list, in my words, I'm not, I've got the mic. <laughs> so, so um, the, the, but at the same time, the top 20% are absolute excellent. They all get paid exactly the same. Now, there must be some way of getting the bottom 20% of teachers up to at least the middle sort of band level. Uh, and some of your recommendations sort of touch on that. So I think mean, the question uh, is, well, how much traction have you got in that sort of thing? We're giving um, education department uh, uh, is aware of the issue. We've publicly made the issue so that they've agreed that there are the three main areas to look at, getting more people in, getting the system wants to be better retained. We do have traction, but uh, I've got to work very closely to show that everyone's a winner when, when I go over the next If you take, for example, you talk about those two shifts in schools, George. We have a school here which is highly performing. We have a school here which is not as, as quite lowly performing. We have the parents down here who shift their kids up to this school. Why do they go to that school? Because the NAPLAN results are better. So they, they leave this school out. So then this school here comes to Treasury and says, we want to build more buildings. This school here says, we've got a third of our building empty. What's the solution? Some people say, we should mandate these people here 
to have to go to their local school. What would the real estate institute say to that? Well, I think you'd be in big trouble by you know, forcing the value of these houses to drop dramatically if they've got a school which is What's the solution? Is it to continue to pour money into this one? What about two ships? No, I don't think it is. I believe it is to increase the quality of the teaching in the school. That's not good as well. Maybe transfer some of the high performing teachers into this school and mix them up with it. Solutions like that. Now, when we say every, in every industry there is a range of points, um, I'm not suggesting that um, anyone's a time server. I'm just suggesting that a little bit more to enhance the, the very good. Thank you very much, Peter, and I'll come back to thank you more formally in a moment. It, it's my job, or might I say, pleasure to move a vote of thanks. Before I do that, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and. Uh, enjoying an outstanding speaker as much I'm sure as what I have. The quality of the questions were great and it's only I think a bit of a disappointment that we all should have filled the MDR downstairs which is no uh, reflection Peter on the quality and content of what you've done. Maybe it's getting close to the end of the year, maybe it's Another COVID scare, I'm not too sure. But bef before acknowledging Peter a little bit um, uh, deeper, I'd like to just reflect in this vote of thanks that there's a key thought here in the financial review this morning, either. There were two articles one was Chris Bowen, and the other one was a, a, a person. Um, very qualified to make comments about productivity is one of the root things we've got to get to to make our economy more vibrant and stronger. Peter drew a lot of comments about where does the money come from, at least that's how I interpret Where does the money come to pay if our tax collections and other incomes to the government from whatever means dwindle because our productivity is falling, as Peter's alluded to, then we start to get other problems. Some of those problems might manifest themselves. And by the way, I'm also uh, not an accountant, but uh, I did do accountancy uh, when I was doing my engineering. So I oh, know just a I little bit about it. Oh, good, yeah. thank you. But um, it, it's perhaps, apart from where does the money come from, uh, Peter's um, highlighted the need for who can hear, uh, who can, or what can we do in this room? We've heard you, Peter, and we should maybe be thinking to help you uh, on this topic. Who who can, what, where's the press got a role to play? Where's um, other people in general conversation? Where's their role to have your story heard for the vibrancy of the state and the country? So if you come back to very fundamentals, we all know this from doing our budgets at home. We've got to make more than what we spend or we're going backwards. And at some stage, if the graphs that Peter has put up, and I'll draw one point on one of those graphs in a moment, if not two, that if the trends are going down, particularly in the stage of our economy now, when we have <coughs> borrowings and everything are up, we've got to pay back that debt. And, and the graphs are going in the wrong way. Perhaps your white paper is very, very timely. We have gone backwards, we've got to reverse it. So Peter has reset our compasses. If we don't increase productivity, our economy is at risk. He asked us to come up with our thoughts on the white paper, and it was very interesting to throw the discussion to every one of our, uh, our papers. I was intrigued, though, that Peter may have missed his profession. When he asked us 
a question put in numbers on how many people hit the site to 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 uh, make a note of it, did he sound like a good auctioneer? He got us up to 20,000, 40,000, 50, and in the end, he, he gave us where the reserve was. Very interesting. Um, you do have a life after your current job. This auctioneer style will stand you in good state. So Peter um, showed us a picture or a series of pictures which if you think about maybe also in cost accounting terms, a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, the first handout he gave us was 10 pages. So uh, just there, we've got 10,000 words saved to get us to the point of what, where his white paper is going. So he's a good communicator and, and we're lucky to see ahead of where that's gonna take us. He's given us, Samples, so it's better than the Royal List of Show. We can take some samples home and read it at our leisure during the rest of the week. The talk, Peter, was efficient and succinct and illustrates productivity to spot. One thing I might just mention, because I've got the microphone now, George, is that um, I, I know education skills are a feature. And I'm going to have the last word on that one because I've got the microphone. That I assume that Barker College is going the right way. Um, the VET system featured, I said I'd look on two, two particulars. The VET system, we've just seen a chart showing a, a number of skills, and we didn't get into what I'll call the main profession, that, that I'm not distinguishing what's better a profession or a skill, but the VET system is surely needing major surgery because we cannot supply the numbers that you're showing are needed. Just like we got at least 20,000 engineers in society shortfall every year, you've highlighted we've got some major problems. And if we don't get good quality people doing that work, our productivity is going to go down. So, Dare I say, with that that slide or that, that page on the vets, we've got a similar problem manifesting itself with the professions to play catch up. <coughs> of particular note to me, I loved it. Well, you can all have a look now again if you wish, but you can trust me, page 227, the energy technology, small modular reactors, very good comment to uh, pick up on. And your comment that I think I quote you right to say, energy should not be technology specific. Uh, I hope I got that right. Uh, so small modular reactors, which can come in with a cost of say six cents per kilowatt hour. Hydro is lower. Um, one of the ways we might achieve a lot of productivity is if we get our energy costs down, and there is one surefire way to get it down. Get small modular reactors, plug and play it under the existing transmission lines. Anyway, uh, technology neutral as a comment I was very happy to. Then we went into the Q&A, and it became obvious that our audience uh, had listened and, and was enjoying the talk. And I think all of us in this room have recognised that the importance of productivity, not just for New South Wales, but Australia generally, is very, very important. I think, Peter, that I can um, surmise that everyone in this room is extremely um, supportive of your white paper. The questions and the nodding I saw around the room indicated that. Balance, um, uh, thorough. You did a very good report in my place, and I'm sure everyone else is in the room. And I think that um, if there's one issue to come, and that is that your political masters adopted and come up with the plans to make it um, uh, happen. So to all in this room, thank you for your contributions. But Peter, you're the star of the day. Uh, thank you for your great and thought-provoking talk. Perhaps 
So the best summary I could make is the state is in good hands if they adopt your white paper the politicians I'm talking about, and they act positively on all in it. Um, it's an over, I don't want to be confused with President, ex-President uh, Trump to, to keep New South Wales and Australia straight. Uh, I didn't say again, so I can't be confused with, uh, mind you, he's head for call of the meat, uh, but um, uh, it is so important. So would you all join me uh, in the appropriate way of thanking In closing, it's great to have seen a return to post-COVID at the UUSC talks, uh, to come here and listen to great speakers and, and learn and, and, and enjoy a nice bit of lunch talking to friends and, and others. Uh, next year, we'll be rolling out again. This is our 10th year. Dick Kell, um, over here in the uh, first seat in front of me, um, and I'm delighted that we've, we've gone, well, I hope the rest of us here in the club are delighted that we made it to 10 years. We've survived through the COVID and I think getting along very well. Next year, we'll probably start our first talk in March. So stay tuned and thank you. And it's not too early. This will be the first time I say happy Christmas and good, um, good New Year to everyone. Thank you.